Good to see y'all this morning on our first morning since school started and our also first Sunday morning since we started back on two services. We are so glad to have each of you today. I want to share a couple of announcements as we get started and then we're going to go ahead and pray. And after we pray, then we're going to go ahead and shake hands with one another. A couple of announcements real quickly. Kids for Christ is going to start back up September 6th. If your kids are a part of that or if you would like to serve in that in that uh, ministry, just let us know. We would love for you to be a part of it. August 23rd, uh, youth group's going to be meeting at the school at 5.30 for Meet the Bronco Night. Then right after that, we'll have youth activities. So we will not start at 5 like we normally do and have an open gym or anything like that. Um, Sanctuary Project update. I shared this on Facebook this week, but it's important that y'all know that uh, we as a church, about two weeks ago or so, we were able to celebrate something that I don't know has ever been celebrated in a church, and I'm not sure ever will be celebrated in a church again, and that is that money got taken out of our account. We're thankful for that because that means that the fire marshal is reviewing our case, and we can possibly start moving forward with picking different people to do different things and, um, and start moving forward with that project. So be praying for that. Be praying for approval in that process, and thank God that we're making progress. Life groups are starting September 17th. If you would like to be a part of a life group, there are different houses that are host houses. If you'd like to be a host house and you forgot to sign up for that, let us know and we would love for you to be one. But we've got a few host houses in the bulletin. We'd love for you to join them. September 17th, again, they start. Uh, we've got a fifth quarter, actually a few fifth quarters coming up. And uh, those dates are in the bulletin. If you're anything like me, you won't remember the dates. But we've got the first one on September 1st. Hey, if you'd like to help out by bringing snacks or cookies or anything like that, um, if you would, just come let me know, and uh, we would love for you to do that for that. Um, ladies, uh, I keep having to read this because I'm trying to remember all the details of it. There is a ladies, catch that, me, I'm not invited. You gentlemen, you're not invited. There's a ladies workout class starting on September 11th. Gentlemen, if you want to work out, uh, we can do push-ups in my office, but... um. Ladies, uh, September 11th, uh, Monday evenings at 7 o'clock, and then Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock a.m. If you'd like to be a part of something like that, Chelsea's going to be heading that up. Y'all can contact her, and um, if you would like to be a part of it, if you could, just bring $5 every time. That way they can pay somebody that's going to be doing some child care. Church isn't going to benefit any from that. It's just going to go straight to that youth or that person that's going to be watching um, your kiddos during that time. One other announcement, we'd love to get to know you better. If you have never... Um, gotten on your phone and gotten the little camera option and scanned this little barcode. We would love to get to know a little bit about you. It's just going to ask you your name, your phone number, things like that, just so that we can reach out and tell you we're glad that you're here. We're not going to be begging for information. We don't need your social security or social security number or anything like that. We just want to reach out to you and tell you thank you for coming. All right, that's all of our announcements. There's probably a few more, but I'm probably leaving them out. But uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. God, thank you for this group. Lord, I pray that we will be faithful to you, and Lord, I thank you that you have been faithful to us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, would you stand up and greet somebody, please?
Fern told me that when I was in fifth grade, and I finally found the chords to it. <laughs> Thank you, Fern, for teaching me that. <laughs>
worship songs. Chris Tomlin, Holy Forever. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of angels to the
some ushers, please.
All right, children, you can get up and you can head to Children's Church. The rest of us, you can turn to the book of First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 1. First Peter, chapter 1. And as the last of the kiddos makes their way out of here, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the truth of your word. As I prayed in the first service, Lord, I pray that we would live by it. I pray that we would um, think on it. I pray that we would live differently as a result of it. I pray that we would share it. Lord, I pray that it would be, uh, I pray that it would be the anchor of our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 1, let me ask you, how many of you have done any farming, any gardening, or how many of you have been able to manage to keep a plant alive for more than about three months? How many of you would say that you fit that category? All right, I, I, I shouldn't have raised my hand because there was somebody that shook their head no, and I'm right there with them. Um, in fact, I, I was talking to Kim this week. I, I'm so thankful for my wife, Kim, and I think that we make a really, really great team but one thing that we really struggle in is gardening together. That's just not our strong point in any way, shape, or form. In fact, when I first got married, I was, uh, I was about 22 years old, and I was pastoring a little church in northeast Texas, and I go to this little pastor's conference in Dallas, and I remember one of the things that one of the speakers said is that every pastor needs to have a garden because that'll teach you to play the, the slow game in ministry. And remember that immediate results are probably not going to happen. So get a garden and remember that daily. And that, really the only thing I remembered is, Kim, we need to start a garden. So I went home that week and, uh, and I told her that. And we decided we would go to church and we would ask about four or five of our friends that were good at that stuff. We said, hey, what is, what is one plant we can start to grow that is foolproof, that will not die no matter what? And all four or five of them said the same thing. I don't remember what it was. But they said, um, if you buy this plant, the good thing about it is you go to this one store, it's already going to be potted for you. All you've got to do is dig a hole, take it out of the pot, put it in the hole, and then fill it in with dirt. And then twice a week, I mean twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, for about two minutes, if you pour a little bit of water on it, you'll be good and it will live forever. And we thought, okay, we got this. Kim worked night shift at the time at the hospital. And I figured, okay, she can take the morning, she can fill it up, and then I'll take the evenings and the only problem with that, it seemed great, the only problem with it is that we were terribly unfaithful. I mean, we were terrible with this thing. Kim never, ever, ever watered these plants at all. And I figured that, you know, she was busy. She had just taken care of a bunch of patients. She was saving lives all night. I could let her go. But if I let that go, I had to overcompensate. And I had to pour a lot of water on these plants. So you know the little nozzle that has the little sprayer that kind of makes it spray all gently on the plants. I would just take the whole nozzle off and I would just douse them for like 10 minutes. And I, and I would do it like four times a week because I'm thinking, okay, they've got to make it. And I remember I'd have these conversations with these plants because I heard you're supposed to talk to your plants. And I would tell them, nobody's dying on my watch. You know, like, I, you're going to make it. Come on. And I'm pouring water on these things. The, and I'm doing this like four or five times a week. And, and what I found is that um, that wasn't enough. In fact, about three months later, every one of those plants had died. And uh, I would like to say that we're better at it at this point, but we've actually got some plants in the last few months, and I wanted to show you a little bit of our growth as adults. So I'll show you one picture real quickly. This is one of our plants that we got a little while back. Um, we appreciate that. And uh, we do plan to put a new plant in it. In fact, I told the first service, Christy's here for two, she... Um, she watered it for us when we went to Wisconsin in May and took care of it, did a great job. It was thriving in May, and it's struggling in August. So that's one. Here's another one. This goes by our windowsill. If you see, it's kind of struggling in the middle. The two on the outside look really good because they're not plants. They're candles. So just, just know that. And then um, show you another one real quickly. Um, this is not actually, uh, isn't there another one right before that? Maybe not. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. Okay, so Amelia, for school, she got a, a little watermelon seed, and everybody was supposed to grow that over the course of the summer. Well, all we ever saw was a styrofoam cup, 
and Kim ended up throwing that cup away before I took the picture. So I just Google image the styrofoam cup to show you how much of a watermelon seed we started to grow. Then the next one, we were really thankful for this. When the church parsonage got built, we were so thankful that you decided in the very front of it for landscaping that you wouldn't put a garden, you instead gave us a rock garden. And nothing has died in there, and we're really thankful. We feel like we've managed that one really, really well to this point. Now, why do I say any of that? It's because we have learned with plants that faithfulness matters. And and in the same way, in our relationship with God, faithfulness is vital. And, And oftentimes we get real excited about this idea of growing in our relationship with the Lord. And we want all the fruits of growth. We want that joy and we want that peace. And man, I want to be able to forgive other people. And man, I just want to be able to walk throughout life knowing that God's with me. But we need to, as believers, Peter's going to tell us as we read this book, he's going to tell us that we need to learn to appreciate the process of growth just as much as we appreciate the fruits of growth. And now, as you think about First Peter, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. And I think most of us know this already, but Peter was kind of a rock star of the early church. And, and when I say a rock star, I mean that literally. Like he, he had the personality of a rock star. In his early life, remember he meets Jesus personally. And Jesus calls out to him in Matthew 4, verse 19. He says, hey, come follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. And in this tremendous moment of courage, Peter drops everything to follow after Jesus. He drops his his job, his friends, his security. He drops everything because he realized knowing the Son of God was worth it. But early on, he was so very raw. Remember, he was just constantly inserting his foot into his mouth. There were times where he's preaching to a thousand people and hundreds of them come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then the very next moment, what's he doing? He's fighting with the rest of the disciples about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. At one point, he's telling Jesus, he's sitting with him at dinner and he says, Jesus, I'm never going to leave you. Like, I I understand all these other people, they're going to reject you at some point. But Jesus, I'm your ride or die. I will never go anywhere. I promise you, I'll be with you to the very end. And later that night, what's he doing? Three times in a row, he denies that he ever met Jesus. I mean, he's just up and he's down. He's up and he's down. He's performing miracles one moment. And then he cuts off a police officer's ear. And it's like Jesus is looking at him saying, I didn't think I'd have to have this conversation. But we don't do that as believers. Like, that's not what we're about. And uh, Peter's just saying, oh, I was trying to help you, man. I mean, that's what I was trying to do right there. He falls asleep when he's supposed to be praying. His life is, again, up and down and up and down, and it's this tremendous roller coaster. But now as he writes the book of 1 Peter, he says, yeah, I was a little bit foolish when I was young. But now he writes it from a different perspective. See, as you get older, um, it kind of gives you a little bit of perspective in life. And I'm not saying that necessarily from experience. But even even Titus chapter 2 kind of talks a little bit about that, how every church needs to be filled with every generation of believers. Uh, There's so much value in having young people and older people alike all hanging out together in the body of Christ. Because I, I want you to know, young people, man, we value you so much because you bring life to this church and you bring energy to this church. You bring this willingness to serve to this church. You, you, bring, you, you bring joy to different people as you just passionately pursue the Lord. And in fact, I think we could all agree. Like, isn't it so cool to see somebody when they first come to faith in Christ and how they're ready to tell everybody that they know about Jesus? Like, I, I don't care about any persecution. I don't care what anybody else thinks. These people need to hear about Jesus. So they're just telling the world. But, but on the flip side, one thing that young people often are lacking, not always, but often are lacking, is wisdom and, and faithfulness. There's a consistency that's lacking if you haven't developed it over time. So what Paul tells Titus in Titus chapter 2 is that young men and young women need to find older men and older women and hang out with them and learn from them what it looks like to be faithful in their relationship with the Lord. And and older men and older women, I I want you to know that really a lot of that responsibility falls on your shoulders because as leaders... You need to seek these people out. You need to say, hey, look, I want you to come over to my house and I'll teach you how to be a godly husband or a godly wife or a godly mom or a godly dad. I want to show you what it looks like to live for Christ in my life. See, we need one another in the body of Christ. And, and, and 
one of the reasons, again, these young people need you is because you've taken your lumps. You, you've taken your lumps, and now through it, you've become more faithful, or at least that's the hope and the prayer. Uh, again, the book of 1 Peter, it was written by an old saint who had taken those lumps early on, and now he's writing to a group of churches filled predominantly with young believers. And the whole book, again, is about just faithfully living for the Lord, even when things get difficult. Now, now why is that so important? To faithfully live for the Lord, even when things get difficult. It's because, we're, and we're going to talk about this for about six weeks in a row, it's because faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. And I want you to catch that. If you're a note taker, write that down. Faithfulness leads to fruitful, fruitfulness. Now, with that in mind, if you would look at 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. We're only going to be there for a second. Peter says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, he's introducing himself at this point. And an apostle is an office that was given to an individual in the early church, not necessarily given to believers today, because it was, one, designated to people who met Jesus personally and actually physically walked with Jesus. But then, two, it was given to people who were sent by Jesus with a specific message. And three, it was, it was a group of people that were there handpicked by Jesus to establish what is known as the early church. And, and Peter says that I'm one of these people. That's God put me in a certain place in human history so that I can impart this wisdom to the local church. And he says, this is who I'm writing to. In the second half of verse one, he says, to those who reside as aliens. Now, isn't it funny how like every 20 or 30 years, people start talking about UFOs again? And, and I know that we're like talking about them a lot right now. I don't know what you believe about them. We're not going to raise our hands and see who believes in them. But that's not what he's talking about right here. When he talks about aliens, he's talking about those who are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You know, in that day, it was extremely difficult to not just be a Christian. It was extremely difficult to live as a Christian. Many commentators believe that this book was written somewhere between 62 and 64 A.D. And in 64 A.D., the Roman emperor at the time was a guy by the name of Nero. And, and Nero at that time began an organized attack on Christians because he believed that the church started a fire in Rome that he thought was going to destroy its economy. So he, was, he had it out for them. But even before that time, he, even as Christians were just starting to open this book for themselves... Much of the church suffered like we would suffer today, not necessarily physically, but they suffered socially. Let me ask you, have you ever lost a friend because you stood by your convictions? Have you ever had an awkward moment with somebody in your social circle because you were living for Christ and you couldn't engage in a certain activity? The church was dealing with that in, in that time. And then on top of it, as this social pressure began to grow, there was also this political pressure where, where riots would be incited. There were times where Christians were attacked and imprisoned because they were sharing the gospel on the streets. On top of that, people couldn't get jobs if they were labeled as being followers of Jesus. It was almost like a scarlet letter. And a lot of the church had this upheaval in that time where, where these people literally had to move to different cities and learn different traditions, and they had to learn new languages and customs, and it was extremely difficult for them. And I think really some of that is abnormal for us today, but not all of it is. In fact, I have a friend in Louisiana who about two years ago lost his job because he approached his employer because they were doing something that was unethical. Like it wasn't legal. And he came to his boss and he said, hey, look, I'm not calling the police. Like I'm not ratting anybody out, but we can't continue to do this because I'm a follower of Jesus. And if we're going to continue to do this, I've got to step away. And he thought, man, me and my boss are really tight. He's going to understand. He's going to quit doing this. And right then his boss let him go. And the saddest part of it all, he said, was that the only person that stood by his side was his wife. And he had friends that left him because they worked there. Nah, man. Hey, look, we need our jobs. His employers, nobody that worked at that place with him stood by his side. In fact, he had family members that were friends with his employer. And they said, man, you had this great job. Why would you do that? Why don't you just give in a little bit? And uh, he, he said, I can't. Well, a couple years ago, or actually about six months ago, he was trying to feed his family. And uh, he couldn't get a good job down in South Louisiana. So he ended up having to get a new job in Illinois. And he's saying, man, I'm just right in the middle of it right now. Like, I have no one. I don't know anyone. It's a different culture. It's weird. I don't have family. I don't have friends. I don't have anything at all. And I called him up, and I said, how are you holding up? And he, for about 45 minutes, just told me that whole story. 
Then at the very end of the conversation, I just asked him, how are you doing spiritually? And I remember he, he told me, and uh, he got real quiet. And he said, Sam, I want you to know, in all of this, no matter how lonely I might feel right now, I will never leave Jesus. I will never turn my back on Jesus, because in this time, he's the only one that never turned his back on me. And, and I would imagine that that's how a lot of the church felt in that day. That, that, man, they may have felt like they were hanging on by a thread. And maybe you felt that way recently. That, man, I'm just hanging on by a thread, and I don't know how I'm going to make it. But if that thread is Jesus Christ, then you've got hope, and you've got confidence in your future because, because you've got Jesus. So praise God for that. Now, here's the thing, though. Often the way that our heart feels about certain circumstances affects the way that our heads think. Yet Peter says it doesn't have to be that way. See, just because you don't feel God in a certain moment doesn't mean that you don't have to continue to serve God. And just because you can't hear God in that moment doesn't mean you can't continue to seek God. And just because you can't see God doesn't mean that you can't trust God. And just because everything around you seems to be falling apart, and your marriage may be struggling, and your kids may be rebelling, and financially you're not where you once were, and you're saying, man, it's just not as good as I'd like it to be, Peter says that doesn't mean you can't still remain faithful because God often uses the storms of life to cause plants to grow. And those seeds of growth are often planted in daily simple moments of watering your garden, just being faithful. So Peter says, do you want to know what that looks like? Like if you, do you want to anchor yourself, do you want to prepare yourself for these moments that are inevitably going to come? Here's what you can do. He says in verse 13, we'll skip down there. He says this, therefore, as a result of all that could be coming, he says, prepare your minds for action. That means gird up your minds, buckle them up, tie them tight. In that day, men would wear these long tunics and that was their outfits they would wear. I, I'm so thankful we don't live in that day today. But these guys, they're wearing these long tunics, and anytime they had to run or they had to do any work at all, they would kind of do what we do with our Crocs today. They would put them in sport mode. They'd kind of tie them real tight and make sure that they were good and compact, and then they'd be able to run and they'd be able to go. And, and what Peter is saying right here is do that with your mind. He says, buckle up your mind, prepare your mind, tighten up the things that come into it. And he says, keep sober in spirit. Now, when the storms of life come, we need an anchor. And what is that anchor? It's truth. And specifically, it's the truth of Jesus Christ. And speaking of him, he says again in verse 13, fix your hope completely. I want you to catch that. Fix your hope completely in Jesus Christ. Now, most of us have hope somewhat in Jesus Christ, right? Like my confidence in the future is somewhat built on the promises of Jesus Christ. But Paul or Peter says right here, fix your hope completely on his truth, completely on his promises. We say, hey, look, I know I know Jesus. And then when I graduate high school, everything's going to be fine. And he says, no, 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 you don't get it. And you say, no, 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 I, well, maybe when I get married, everything will be good. And he says, no, 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 you don't get it if that's where your hope is. And he says, well, maybe my, maybe my job might get better or I may get that raise and then I'll be good. And he says, no, no, if that's where your hope is anchored, then you don't get it. He says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation or when you see Jesus Christ. Now, that's good, right? that one day I'm going to see him. And when I see him, all the troubles that I'm dealing with right now and all the struggles of work and all the struggles of family and all those interpersonal things that I'm battling with, all those things that I'm dealing with within my mind, when I see Jesus, I'm going to be known and I'm going to know him perfectly and that's going to be great. It's going to be perfect, right? Now we'll come back to that in a moment. You want a simple daily practice that will serve as an anchor to both you and your family if you start to implement it right now? I mean, it'll impact your, gener your, your family for generations to come if you just simply live it out right now. Look at verse 23. God's word says that we have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable. So if you've personally trusted Christ, if you've received Christ alone as your Savior, you have this imperishable gift of God, one that will not wither, it will not fade, it will not die no matter how much you fail. But then he says, and that gift has been revealed to us through the enduring word of God. Verse 24, for all flesh is like grass 
in all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Now, again, do you want a simple daily practice that will serve as an anchor for both you and your family for generations to come? If you live it out, this is all it is. Ten words. Spend daily time alone with Jesus and with Jesus together. Does that make sense? Spend daily time alone with Jesus and with Jesus together as a family. God's word says all flesh is like grass. In all of our beauty, it's like a flower. We spend so much time and some of us spend so much money trying to continue to be young. And the more money we spend on it, the more time we spend on it, the more we realize we're all getting older, right? Right? <laughs> That's kind of a hard reality to accept. I keep telling myself that if I just work out a little bit more, that six-pack that I never had is going to come back, and I'm going to see it. And I realize it's just not happening, and it's frustrating to me at times. And I told somebody recently that I'm finally at that age in life where I'll wake up sore, and then I'll remember that I didn't even work out the day before. And it's kinda, that's kind of discouraging, right? See, age is catching up to every one of us, and, and none of us are going to be here forever. But there's one thing that we can establish right now that will last forever, and that is a godly legacy. Guys, do you, you want to make a tremendous impact on your kids? Like, just think about that. Do you want to make a tremendous impact on your kids even after you're gone? Then give them God's word daily. Maybe you don't have kids. You want to make an impact on your friends Find a friend that you can open the word of God with and just study it together. Just talk about it together. Bounce ideas off of one another. Keep each other accountable. Open the word of God on a daily basis. Read it. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. Just think about it. What does that one verse say? What does it mean? How can I live it? How can it shape the way that I live my life? Memorize a verse every once in a while and be intentional to share what you're learning with other people. Now, I, I want you to think about this for a moment. Let's just make sure we're all here. How many of you have one of these with you? Everybody raise your hand if you got one of these with you. Man, I'll be honest with you. I, I really love these, and I really appreciate these. In fact, I thank the Lord for their usefulness. But there are so many moments that I wish I could go back to a Nokia flip phone. Is anybody with me at all? I, I, I would love to do that. Do you remember the day where we only had 100 text messages we could send or receive a month? And then if you got more than 100 of those, you started having to pay. So what would you do when you got to about 75 and, and, and you realized, all right, it's coming, the deadline's coming, I'm almost there. What would you do? You would be forced to pick up your phone and actually connect with people by talking to them, right? And then on top of that, do you remember the day where in order to get on the internet on your phone, you would get charged for every minute? So if you absolutely had to Google something, what would you do? You would Google it really, really fast. Then you'd get off your phone as quick as you could. And then again, you would be forced to look at the person that was in front of you and you'd have to connect with them. Man, I can't help but think that today's day and age has caused me to miss out on so many vital conversations that I could have had with my kids, or I could have had with my wife, or I could have had with people all around me because I'm simply so connected to my phone. And on top of that, on a spiritual level, I want you to think about this. When you open up your phones, you have immediate access to some of the greatest Bible teachers in the entire world if you just get on that podcast app. You just search whoever you want to search. You can listen to almost anybody you want to listen to. On top of that, if you don't have time to read your Bible or you don't think that you may have time in a day to read your Bible, you can get on TikTok, and if you scroll long enough, chances are you're going to find a 45-second snippet in God's Word, and you're going to be able to say, man, that was a great time with God today. Man, that was a great 45 seconds. That was really, really wonderful, right? And I think because of all of that, it's really easy for us to miss out on just simply doing this on a daily basis. God, what do you want to see? What do you want to share with me today? God, let me, let me open your word. I want to meet with you face to face because I recognize if I want to hear the voice of God, I've got to open the voice of God. So God, I want to hear from you today. What do you want to share with me? Oh, is it, is it right here? Okay, this is really sticking out. God, this is what you're teaching me today. Guys, I want to encourage you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you want to impact the people around you. You've got to open 
God's word for yourself. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but it is God's word that will endure forever if planted into your children's lives. It is God's word that will last forever if planted into your husband or your wife's soul. It is God's word that will make an impact on that, that co-worker or that neighbor that's finally starting to ask questions about God. Give people the word of God after you've given yourself the word of God. Think about this for a moment. I love giving and receiving gifts. Like, I, I don't know if people talk about love languages. I, maybe I'm a little selfish. I just like receiving gifts. I don't, I don't know what it is about that. It makes me feel good every time I get one. And, uh, and, and I'll say, like, I've gotten a lot of gifts in my life, and there are a lot of them that I've probably forgotten about over time. There are a lot of them that I'll probably remember the rest of my life, but there are a lot that, like, I just may not remember. But if, if you want to think about a gift that you can give to other people that they will remember a billion years from now, and they will continue to thank you for it a billion years from now, what is that one gift you can give them? You can give them the truth of God's word, and specifically the truth of, a, uh, the truth of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul in Romans 12, he told Christians that we don't need to be conformed to the pattern of this world. That means that all day, every day, our minds are being flooded with information. And a lot of the stuff that we're being flooded with is not truth, right? A lot of what's coming into our minds probably needs to be pushed out of our minds as quick as it came in. But because we're getting flooded with this, these lies and this worldliness and this sin, we're constantly being challenged to, to push the line a little bit further, a little bit further. And what Paul says, don't be conformed to that stuff. Instead, he says, be transformed. Be changed, but how do we be transformed? He says, by the renewing of our mind. And what he's saying is that daily, if you want to be transformed by God, you've got to allow him to speak to your mind by opening his word and flushing out your system. you just got to flush out your system every day and say, all right, God, purify my mind, purify my heart. I want your truth. I need more of you. So I'm just going to open this up when it's difficult, when it's fun, when it's easy, when it's hard, I'm just going to open your word and let it be an anchor for my life. Now, again, why is that so important? It's because fruitfulness is sprouted in faithful living. And, and I want to challenge some of you with this. As we're kind of wrapping up this sermon and as we're kind of wrapping up this week, I want you to kind of think about this. You know, somebody once said that the difference between being a good leader and a great leader is consistency. We've heard before that it takes about six to eight weeks to form a habit. That's about how long we're going to be in 1 Peter together. I want you to think about your daily spiritual life. Not, not just like showing up to church once a week or anything like that. I want to think about your daily spiritual life. And I want you to think about this. If it takes about six to eight weeks to form a habit, what are some good spiritual habits that I can establish right now that will affect me and affect the people I love the most over the next not only six to eight weeks, but years to come. Like, maybe it's, maybe it's not even reading God's word. Maybe you're already faithful with that. Maybe you're saying, though, prayer is really hard for me. That may be you. Maybe like Daniel did in, in the book of Daniel, maybe you need to establish a few times a day where you set an alarm and say, all right, God, I'm gonna give this next five minutes to you. I'm just gonna talk to you. Maybe it is just your faithfulness in church and you're saying, man, I'm just here and then I'm not. And then, you know, one day the worship service really didn't feel like it was for me, so I won't be here for the next few months. And then that one sermon series, it was just so boring. Could Sam please keep me awake? I'm not going to be here for a little while. And then we just kind of come up and down. What are those spiritual disciplines that you need to implement today that could affect your family for years to come? Now, why, is this so, why does this matter? Again, fruitfulness is sprouted in faithfulness. And I have a feeling that in a crowd like this, there are some of you that are kind of like this. A couple months ago, Kim had a little project for me at the house, and I realized all I needed to do if I was going to do what she needed me to do was I needed to unscrew something, and after I unscrewed it, I needed to just replace the batteries. So we have a drill. I could have used that. That would have been no problem at all, but I grabbed a screwdriver, and I thought, okay, I'll just unscrew it really easily. So I walked up to this thing, and if you know anything about me, I'm not good at fixing anything. I'm not really good at breaking anything either. I'm just not good at any of this stuff. And I walk up to it, and I start to unscrew it, and right when I go up to it, it doesn't budge. And I thought, okay, we have a screwdriver, or we have, we have a drill, but now I've already started it, and I need to prove to my wife that I'm strong. So I go up to it again, and I go to unscrew it, and nothing's happening. 
So then she looks at me and she says, hey, you want me to go get the drill? And I said, no, not at all. I'm going to get this. And I go up to it again and I just keep doing it again and again. And I'm trying to unscrew it and nothing's happening. And finally, as I'm doing this for like five minutes, finally, I just start to as hard as I could and nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, it just busts loose. It was a cool thing. Now it was a pride moment, but it was a cool thing for me. And in that moment, I saw something happen that could happen in a lot of our lives. See, oftentimes growth doesn't just happen so sometimes it does, but often growth just kind of comes in these spurts, right? Where it's like, man, I just keep reading God's word and I feel like I'm not getting anything out of it and I need to give up and it's so frustrating right now and we just keep pushing forward and we say, oh man, God, you just revealed all this great stuff to me. And man, my prayer life is just not where it needs to be. And I feel like I'm praying to a wall. Why am I doing this? Why am I showing up to church? Why do I keep telling these people about Jesus? And I'm trying, and I'm trying. And Paul, not Paul, Peter would say, just remain faithful. Just don't give up. See, again, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we oftentimes, I think we have these moments where we could experience breakthrough. And Satan causes these little moments to discourage us. And we say, all right, I tried and nothing happened. I didn't see breakthrough. I'm done. Peter, Peter says, don't let that happen in your spiritual life. In fact, as a believer in Jesus Christ, again, we talk about how we enjoy growth. We need to learn to enjoy the, the process of growing as a Christian and wrestling with God's word, and wrestling in prayer, and dedicating ourselves to a life of holiness and purity, and, and, and all these things that oftentimes we avoid talking about because they're not popular in our society. He says, just keep at it. Just keep at it, and maybe, just maybe, you're on the brink of a breakthrough. Now, I also want you to think about this, though. Maybe you're hearing all of this, and you're saying, man, I don't really feel like this is where I'm at. Like, I, I actually don't even know if I know God. I don't know what I think about God. I hear you talk about God all the time. I hear you talk about Jesus Christ all the time. Uh, I, I was, I was kind of thinking about that this week and realizing there's going to be unbelievers in here. And this is a, a sermon kind of really largely given to believers in Jesus Christ. But then I read this quote from Shane Pruitt. And, and he said these words. He said, you can read God's word. You can quote God's word. You can memorize portions of God's word. But if the God who inspired this word doesn't live inside your heart, none of this matters because you're lost. And maybe that describes you. Maybe you're saying, I'm not growing because I'm not even sure that I know Jesus. Like, I, I don't even know if I have a relationship with him. And if that describes you today, I just want to encourage you. I want to invite you. All this stuff we've talked about, growth comes in a process, but a relationship with God happens in one moment. Doesn't happen slowly that, oh, all of a sudden he accepts me. Oh, all of a sudden he forgives me. No, it happens when I just simply say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I absolutely need Jesus Christ. So today I'm trusting in him that he died for me, that he rose again, that he's the only one that can save me. Jesus, come enter my life. The moment that we trust in him, he's all ours forever and ever. Have you trusted Jesus? I want you to bow your heads with me for a moment. I'll talk to two separate groups for a minute. First off, I want to talk to those who haven't trusted Jesus. Maybe you're saying, I, I, maybe I did when I was young, but I'm just not sure that I ever fully understood the gospel. But it makes a little bit of sense now that I've gotten a little bit older. Maybe just today you're saying, oh, it all clicked. And I realized, like, I just need Jesus. I need to place my faith in him. If that would describe you, why don't you just tell him right now? Why don't you tell him something along these lines? You can start off by saying, just silently in your heart, you can say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Just tell him that right now. And God, I'm sorry for all that I've done wrong. God, I know that I can't save myself. God, I can't work my way into heaven. I can't forgive myself. Just tell him this stuff. But God, I know that you can. And I know that you sent your son, Jesus. And Jesus died for me. Jesus rose again. And he offered me salvation, so I'm trusting in him today. Please forgive me. Please save me. Please come into my life. Hey, if that represents your heart, and you for the first time, you're just saying, man, I, today I just know that I accepted Christ. Like, I, I know that I trusted him today. If that's you, would you just look at me real quickly? Just look at me real quick and let me know. 
And if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to think about one daily discipline of yours, one daily habit that you're just saying, man, spiritually, I'm not there with that, and I need to give this to God. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to publicly just make a commitment that I'm going to start reading my Bible. Maybe I need to publicly make a commitment that I'm just going to have a more active prayer life. Maybe I just need to publicly um, commit to this church and say, all right, this is going to be my church family. Maybe, maybe you just need to privately sit in your seat during our invitation and say, God, like I'm not where I need to be. And I need to work some things out. Yeah, I know I have a relationship with you, but I'm not where I need to be. And I wanted to discipline myself to grow in my faith. I also want you to think about this. What are some daily routines or daily habits of yours that are destructive to your relationship with the Lord? Maybe you're battling with some addiction. Maybe you're da- battling with a secret sin issue and nobody else knows about it. And you're saying, man, I just need help. I just need prayer. Maybe I just need to come to the altar and just say, God, I'm giving it to you. What is that one thing that's destructive in your relationship with the Lord? And how can you give that to God today? Let's pray. God, I pray that as we think about the life of Peter, all these things that I've talked about this morning, he, he dealt with them. Lord, he was up and he was down and sometimes he was disciplined and sometimes he wasn't at all. And Sometimes he spoke out of turn, and sometimes he did things that were out of turn. And I'm sure that there were many times that he just kicked himself and said, God, why can't I be more like you? And Lord, I think that we've all wrestled with that, and I thank you so much for your grace, and I thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you that you're faithful to us even when we're not very faithful to you. Lord, I pray that as we think about your faithfulness, I pray that we'll be more consistent in pursuing you daily. And Lord, for those who haven't yet trusted Christ, I pray that today will be the day of their salvation. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to sing two verses of the next song. We may sing more if we need to. But um, our plan is to sing two verses of the next song. If you need to confess anything to God, you need to make any commitments before the Lord, I'm going to be right here. I would love to talk with you. I would love to pray.